If I told you that this character had three eyes, would you believe me? What if I told you that the world government was ruled by a supercomputer named after Mother Nature herself, the sea? An ancient set of records named Umi, now known as Emu, is the central brain in a world-spanning network exactly like punk records, designed to store people's dreams when they sleep. Stored where? Inside the sea itself, a literal sea of dreams secretly controlled by the world government. And it doesn't stop at punk records. Vegapunk's artificial sun may also not be so hypothetical after all. Still with me? Okay, what if I said that just like how Vegapunk, the main Stella body, has six satellites, Emu has five elder stars, or five clones or satellites of itself that never age and rank above even the celestial dragons, each one designated to governing each of the four blues and the grand line. And Emu's third eye, or maybe even that crown, is the antenna connecting them all, just like Vegapunk's apple. All to create this illusion of oligarchy, of shared leadership. A normal person would stop there. But for the daring, for the curious, and the ones willing to look at all the possibilities, I'm going to take it one step further. Let's go beyond One Piece. What if another mangaka unintentionally predicted all this 21 years ago? It's been over a year since we've opened this bar, and to end out 2022 and to show you all my appreciation this holiday season, I'm finally taking a crack at this highly requested topic. Yes, take a seat, grab a snack, and relax, because today, I'm exposing the shittiest landlord in One Piece. For this video, I want you to forget all my other theories up until now. My original mega theory? Forget it. Green line video? Nope. Blank slate territory today, guys. Done? Alright, good. Hello, happy holidays, and welcome to the Hidden Island. I got good news and bad news. Uh, bad news first. I left the gas on, and the old bar exploded. Spent all last week rebuilding with Lee J. Was a whole thing. Good news, the bar looks nicer now. So, let's show our thanks to Lee J by giving him a follow on Twitter and thanking him for this excellent work yet again. And while we do that, here's some food for thought. What's the energy that powered this big boy? The Iron Giant suddenly awoke and assaulted Mary Joie 200 years ago, around the time that fishman rights became a major political issue. It wasn't able to do more than climb the red line, however, because it ran out of power. That means, somehow, after 600 years of dormancy, something awoke this giant. Something provided it with the ancient energy it requires to function. I believe that energy is people's dreams. And at the time, enough people may have wished for Fishman equality to shortly spark this robot back to life and drive it to attack the oppressor living above them. And how did I arrive at this conclusion? A lot of weed. Not actually. According to Vegapunk, the One Piece world is filled to the brim with endless energy that people can't see. He speaks of an ancient kingdom that once had access to a dynamic power source that would change the way we saw the world today. He also mentions how devil fruits and everything else in the world are born out of desires and the dreams of people. That humanity's hopes for their future may be the true power behind devil fruits. So what if this went for everything else too? What if devil fruits weren't the only thing powered by these dreams? Something left entirely up to the imagination can probably be considered dynamic. Dreams themselves could possibly be the intangible source of power that the ancient kingdom harnessed, the one that Vegapunk has been looking for all this time. But we'll come back to him. If this is all true, then I believe the invisible energy all around us and all things being born of desire are connected, not only to each other, but to the voice of all things. This might all be one and the same, so hearing the voice of all things may actually just be the ability to perceive the dreams of all things. Well, in that case, what can this tell us about the mysterious 
3i tribe who have this ability as well. If the ancient kingdom was built utilizing this energy and there's a race of people with the inherent ability to perceive this invisible power, then they must have been very important. So important that I'm surprised they haven't been spoken of more. Out of all the races in One Piece, they're the only one of which we haven't seen a pure member. Correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but even the elusive Lunarians and ancient giants have an example we can look towards. But Pudding? She's half human and hasn't even awakened her ability yet. So where do we go for answers? We haven't met a full 3i tribe member yet. Have we? I believe this ancient power source and the Three-Eye tribe are actually central to the power struggle in One Piece currently unfolding. And while Oda's been hiding this connection from us, Pudding's reintroduction into the plot may begin to reveal some answers, because the true nature of this third eye is not what we thought before. But let's rewind a second. So there's this girl, right? Might be a guy, who knows. She goes to a different school. She's really smart and popular with all the boys. Good with animals. Also, she's the secret ruler of the world, commanding the government from the shadows, and is maybe, probably, very likely the main perpetrator behind the events of the Void Century. Did I mention this person is kind of a douchebag? This is Emu. Or Eem. Or however else you pronounce it, because honestly, who cares? And Emu is probably one of the most enigmatic, important characters in One Piece, with almost every single relevant detail being contained to a handful of panels with minimal dialogue over a whopping three whole chapters. So when you're making any Emu theory in the year 2022, you immediately run into a very obvious problem. I mean, aside from the current lack of dialogue, motivations, backstory, personality, information, or proper introduction. No, it's worse than that. We don't even know what this guy looks like. How would you go about describing this silhouette? What shapes do you distinguish here? One piece for a shack test. Let's go. A uh, finger with a big splinter. Two guys in a tablecloth. Low-hanging fruit joke? Another low-hanging fruit joke. Kevin the sea cucumber from that one Spongebob episode. Have I made it clear yet how vague this shape is? And that's unfortunate, because knowing what Emu is can help us understand why Emu is. But for now, we're left with very limited information about Emu's shiz. So what's the biz? Okay, I'll stop. Good old process of elimination. What is Emu definitely not? Judging by size, not a giant or dwarf. Based on shape, I think we can safely rule out snake neck or mink. No ears or tail or garchewing the Gorosei to be found here. No wings in sight either, so probably not a sky person. For political reasons, Fishman is off the table as well. Everyone else up in Marijuana seemed to just be ordinary humans. Kind of narrows down our options a bit. Pretty much has to be something with regular old proportions, doesn't it? Or at least proportions that look ordinary with the cloak on. The only races in one piece that fit the bill here are humans, and the slight variations on humans, such as the long arms, or the long legs, or the long noses, and the mythical long dongs. Male or female is another thing to consider, I guess. Going by how Oda usually handles both sides, Emu is either an atypically slim male or the first female character post time skip without an F cup. So, human like, with maybe feminine proportions, works best for me. But I'm not ruling out scrawny old men. That can't be the end of the story, though. These guys wouldn't listen to this guy unless this guy gave these guys a damn good reason. Emu must have some ability or power or knowledge that makes them more special than everyone else in the world. If not a basic human, we're still left with a few tribes as options. Let's narrow it down even further. Do we know anything else about Emu's design? By chance, is there any particular body part or parts or features getting a lot of overt emphasis in every panel they're in? Yes, exactly. You guessed it. Tiny hands. Emu is part of the Tiny Hands tribe. I'm telling you, that crown is overcompensating for something. Okay, okay, it's actually the eyes. Every single time Emu is shown to us, there's clear focus being placed on their eyes. And are there any human-like races that are distinguished specifically by their eyes? Well, look at that. That's pretty convenient. Even weirder to me that this is the only known human variant that isn't openly listed for sale at the human auction. Super rare? Maybe. Something the world government doesn't want to acknowledge? Also maybe. Despite the sheer number of possible outcomes, it makes the most sense to me that Emu has the latent ability to understand poneglyphs and hear the voice of all things. That Emu has three eyes. It is very fitting that much like Emu, we do not know what a proper three-eyed tribe member looks like. The former is hidden by extreme secrecy, and the latter by extreme rarity. They're probably the rarest tribe in One Piece. If Emu happens to be or look female, then it would make sense that the first three-eyed person we meet in the story is also a lady. If the voice of all things is connected to dreams, an element of the mind, then it also makes sense that Pudding's Devil Fruit allows her to access your mind too. Her power is specifically the ability to alter, replace, and delete your memories. In a way, isn't this exactly what 
Emu does, but on a much larger scale. Fun fact, this is actually a reference to the third eye in real-life Taoism, which is believed to be related to your memories. In other cultures like Hinduism, the third eye is believed to let you see other planes of existence once awakened. In science, the third eye is actually a nickname for the pineal gland, an organ in the center of your brain responsible for processing light like your eyes do. When it's dark out, this organ notices and releases melatonin, the hormone in your brain that makes you tired and makes you fall asleep. My pineal gland, for example, does not seem to work properly, which is why I'm awake right now at 4am writing about Japanese cartoons. Maybe this also has something to do with why Blackbeard never sleeps. If he's anything like me, he probably spends his nights awake, staring at the ceiling, being harassed by intrusive thoughts. So, no matter where you look, the third eye has overt connections to dreams and memories, both mechanisms by which our brain organizes experiences and ideas, and both concepts which have ties to inherited will and the voice of all things. What is the voice of all things? Nobody really knows, but at the very least, it allows things to communicate telepathically. People can use the voice of all things to talk to others, even if they are not physically capable of speaking. Accounting for this, is it a coincidence that Luffy used the voice of all things to communicate with Momonosuke while he was unconscious? That Kaido felt Luffy's stare in a very similar set of circumstances. That Luffy first awakened his dreamlike god form at night after being knocked out. Dreams and alternate realities definitely play some role in all this and might be connected. So maybe the ability to perceive the voice of all things is the ability to perceive the dreams of all things, to tap into a different, more spiritual plane of existence where you can hear those voices and animals like the Sea Kings and Zunisha are tapping into your mental DMs. And maybe when those dreams materialize strongly enough, you get situations like the Clubouterman and inanimate objects like the Poneglyph speaking to Roger. But three-eyed people can only access the voice of all things after they Awaken their third eye. Awakening becomes a much more interesting word in the context of this conversation, doesn't it? One thing I noticed is that some, but not all, eyes in one piece have gained a ring when they undergo some kind of awakening. Cavendish falls asleep, and then Hakubo, with this additional ring, wakes up. Luffy's eyes gain a ring when he passes out and then reawakens. Mihawk's eyes are explicitly described as Hawk's eyes. Could be they weren't always that way. Maybe he's also achieved an awakening of some sort, unrelated to devil fruits, but to his sword instead. I don't know, you work the Hawk thing in there somewhere. And so Emu is someone who may have awakened their third eye and thus the double ringed pattern on their eyeballs may just be an indication of that awakening. Now one question that comes to mind if this is true is where the hell did all the other three eye people go? We haven't seen any besides pudding, a half human walking around. And why even make the point of half-human or not unless there was some important distinction to be made later? Here's another stumper. If Big Mom boinks some full-blooded three-eye guy to make this half-human three-eye girl, then why the hell has she spent the last 16 years waiting on Pudding to awaken her ability when she's had access to this hypothetical adult-aged, fully three-eye dude? She had to learn about this eye thing from someone. She must have known what she was getting into when she banged Pudding's dad. Couldn't he just read the Poneglyphs for her? And where is this guy anyway? Scoop Pound, give me this guy's sad flashback. Something about going to Tobacco Island for a pack of smokes one day, getting hammered and dying in a bar fight because the voice of all things told him that Charlotte High Fat was talking hella shit three seats over. Point is, there doesn't seem to be any good reason for why Big Mom is forced to rely on Pudding when she's not the only three-eye member Big Mom has had access to. Unless she's adopted, but even then, where do you adopt a member of the three-eye tribe? Like, how is it possible to stumble upon one of these babies, but finding another adult is so impossible that the only option is to wait 20 years until this baby grows up and maybe awakens her eye power. By which point any of your rivals can just get to laugh tail first. I don't know, it seems like a shot plan. Unless this was a one of a kind baby. A boss baby, per se. Unless there weren't any parents around to adopt from, but a government organization instead. Like the shady ones who worked with Mother Carmel or the seedy people involved in the underworld who are clearly very chummy with Big Mom. I think the answer is that there's no father at all. Who's to say that pudding isn't a test tube baby? Doesn't pudding always come in a cup? I'm, I'm sorry. The world government just dumped... <laughs> The world government just dumped a ton of resources into cloning Lunarians and the ancient giants before them. And so, the half-human part is because her DNA was made, in part, using the lineage factor of a real, three-eyed person and a normal human, making her not a genuine three-eye. In the same way that the Seraphim, while looking like Lunarians, are not true Lunarians. They're Fugazi, artificial, biologically engineered. 
I mean, isn't it weird that we don't see any true three-eyed people walking around the One Piece world? Clearly, there aren't many because Blackbeard had to resort to kidnapping Pudding of all people. No one seems to talk about them much despite their importance. You'd think this would be more urgent or openly discussed considering all it takes is for their third eye to awaken or whatever and all of a sudden we have another Nico Robbins situation. Don't forget that a bunch of people who actually went at it the hard way got Buster called, but apparently these guys have a racial passive that's the in-story equivalent of pulling out your phone on a test and googling the answers. And you're telling me there's an entire tribe of people with a built-in cheat code just chilling somewhere uncontested? No, not gonna buy it. So yeah, you guys get the idea. There's a lot of reasons I have to believe in the three-eye thing. And if we can believe all this, then we're left with a big fat question. Who were the actual three-eye people? I believe they, much like Pudding, were modified humans created by the ancient kingdom. Why? Well, I think Vegapunk is being used by Oda to hint towards what the Ancient Kingdom was truly capable of, and Vegapunk has successfully managed to create artificial life in the form of the Seraphim. They're designed to be weapons, specifically the most powerful beings in the world, and these beings are designed to be controlled by someone else. Problem here is, and we're seeing this play out with Luchi, this system can be turned against you really quickly if the wrong person gets their hands on the controls. This got me thinking. The Void Century, as described by Shaka, is a period of war. The 20 allied kingdoms versus one highly advanced kingdom. Tell me, how on earth do these 20 bumblefucks manage to come out on top here when their enemy can presumably create nuclear bombs from their imagination alone? The only answer I can come to is that the advanced technology of the ancient kingdom was turned against itself. You have to fight fire with fire. And if this power source is related to dreams and the voice of all things, then what I'm suggesting is that the three eye people were developed around that source of power, intentionally created with the ability to see and interpret this special power. We're in big reaching territory here, I know. But if the values of the ancient kingdom were those of freedom, then it could be that they gave their creations the freedom of choice. And it was this virtue of theirs, this prioritizing of freedom that was actually used against them. Maybe their seraphim, the three eyes, were manipulated or commanded by the enemy to turn against their creators, not unlike how the seraphim are being turned against their creator right now, or how Squard was manipulated from the outside into betraying his father. And so now we have Emu, who I hypothesize is a true three-eyed person secretly carrying out their own agenda after having eliminated their creator 800 years ago. Vegapunk, in this way, in all his fervor to invent and push the world forward, is unknowingly unearthing and recreating the disasters of the past, in a way picking up from where they left off 800 years ago, inheriting their will through Ohara, who themselves inherited it through the Poneglyphs. So perhaps the Poneglyphs aren't just an account of history, but a warning for the future as well, one that we have yet to realize. What am I implying with this? Well, I feel like there may be a lot more parallels between the Ancient Kingdom and the current applications of Vegapunk's knowledge that we aren't yet aware of. Vegapunk recently had a whole speech about the energy all around us that's right there and we just can't see it. Lilith expressed a desire to find a power source, an undying flame that never runs out. Well, what are some things that can't be stopped? Inherited will, people's dreams, and destiny. As long as people hunger for freedom, these things will exist. And none of these things are tangible, physical things we can see and touch. But they are, in a way, everywhere. Maybe dreams, destiny, and will are one and the same force here. Devil fruits continue to exist, forming again and again even after their user has passed on. Just like will can be inherited through the generations, the past is always leaving us and the future is always coming towards us. These are never-ending cycles, and if there is a genuine power source at work here, maybe it means that the world operates on the energy of cycles, the force behind life and death and life again. Could this be what powers the ancient weapons? Could it be that devil fruits are powered by the cyclical energy of dreams and will? Think of it like the spiral in Gurren Lagann or the power of spin in JoJo's. Theoretically, if you could create a perpetual motion machine, an endless spiral, you'd have then created an infinite source of energy. If people's dreams never end, and if there was a way to harness the energy that people's bodies produce when they dream, then as long as you have people, you have infinite energy. The people using the energy are also the ones creating it, which on paper should be theoretically impossible, but this is also a world where no one questioned how this happened exactly. Dreams are what drive all the characters in our story. Each of the Straw Hats have their own distinct, defined dream, and so do many other major characters. It's a constant driving force for both them and the plot. Dreams are the thing that literally fuels our adventure. No matter what, there's always people dreaming, 
always people striving for more, and thus this dynamic energy is always being made. The world keeps turning, people keep dreaming, and the planet has the potential to become one big magical battery. Vegapunk said his dream is to create a world where energy is free and available to everyone. Why? Because it would remove the motivation behind many of the world's conflicts. However, Vegapunk fears his pursuit of this dream because in doing so, he would learn the source of this war machine's power. But that's a contradiction, no? If the Iron Giant is said to have been powered by some wondrous infinite energy source, then why were they at war? Doesn't seem like any conflicts were resolved to me. If this kingdom had access to all these marvels of technology and automation, why were there slaves everywhere? Wouldn't the greedy kings and queens back then be able to make more money by just automating everything? This could only mean that not everyone had access to these technological advancements. Something isn't adding up. If there was all this amazing technology, then the ancient kingdom likely possessed immense power. If they had some special energy source, the same one powering this thing, then it most definitely wasn't available to all. So what may have actually happened is those 20 kings formed an alliance to seize that power from them. Thus ensued a hundred years of war, producing weapons of mass destruction, and possibly killing untold numbers of people. Get it? It's just like the real world. Isn't that depressing? Okay, so the 20 kings beat this ancient kingdom somehow. They got what they came for. We can assume that whatever they got is probably still in use today, secretly. There's a good chance that energy is currently being put to use, and in that case, where are they getting it from? Hell, how did the ancient kingdom do it? I think Vegapunk is just the guy to look to for answers. He's based off of Einstein, the guy who came up with the theory of special relativity, you know, E equals MC squared, the famous one. Yeah, that formula is used to describe the relationship between matter and energy, and the ability to convert between them. It theorizes that a large amount of energy can be used to make a small amount of matter. Because of the sheer amount of energy needed, this formula is especially useful when talking about nuclear fusion, the process occurring in stars and in our sun. One Piece Einstein speaks of two very specific, very powerful inventions that he is trying to create. One of them is a worldwide neural network called Punk Records. The other is an artificial sun powered by an undying energy source. I believe the two are actually connected. If we tie Vegapunk's devil fruit research into this, it could be that devil fruits are what happen when you take an immense amount of this dream energy and convert it into a physical form. So Oda might actually be applying the theory of special relativity here. This dream energy with enough of it available should be convertible into physical matter. When you do so, you get devil fruit powers, a physical manifestation of people's dreams. So I think the original punk records is actually used to extract the dreams from people and the artificial sun is produced or created by this energy. If that isn't enough, I believe these two inventions still exist today. Vegapunk has based his inventions and research so far on the capabilities and remnants of the ancient kingdom. He claims their advancements surpass even his comprehension. It's a safe bet that the ancient kingdom was at least capable of creating the inventions he is dreaming of. Pun very much intended. They very likely already had their own neural network. But if their inventions utilize some kind of dream energy, then unlike Vegapunk's idea, their punk records may not have explicitly been a library of knowledge. It was, instead, a library of dreams. And just like punk records, all of humanity back then would upload their dreams to some massive database at the end of every day. Every night, somewhere in the world, people go to sleep and their brain waves and their hopes for the future synchronize with this database to this ancient punk records. The dreams within would then be used to power all the various creations of the ancient kingdom like the iron giant or maybe even devil fruits and the ancient weapons. Anyone spot the problem? We know that Vegapunk needed this massive egg thing to store all the info from his brain and for the brain waves to reach him and his clones. But this is just for Vegapunk's brain alone. He hasn't expanded the scope of this project beyond himself yet, and if he were to, he'd need a hell of a lot of space to accommodate all of humanity's knowledge. If the Ancient Kingdom had such a computer, where could they have stored all of humanity's dreams for all those years? And where are they being stored now? Well, what's the largest plot of unused real estate available on the planet? How about inside the planet itself? Or while we're at it, specifically within the ocean? You could fit like a million Walmarts in there. Let's look at Punk Records again for a second. Vegapunk specifically says that once he connects all of humanity, he'll be able to create a sea of knowledge. Maybe this is more literal than it seems at first. Instead of a library of dreams, the punk records of the past was an actual sea of dreams. Sounds stupid at this point, I understand. Want some more evidence? This is described as an egg. Punk records is inside this egg. What is inside real eggs? A whole lot of liquid. What is the most abundant thing in the One Piece world, aside from Big Mom's cheeks? That's right water. Their world is even more ocean than ours is. Did you know that only 0.5% of Earth's water is drinkable? Oh, well, that's not a lot. You might think, but you'd be wrong. That amounts to 2.2 million gallons. 
or 8.4 million liters for all my Euro friends out there of drinkable water for every one of the 8 billion people on the planet. And that's only a whole 0.5% of the total water on Earth. Now imagine that, but in this case, there's even more water. Liquid data storage is thought to be way more effective than solid state. It's said that you can fit one terabyte of data within a tablespoon of liquid drive. Think about that. Using liquid, your computer hard drive, taking up the same amount of space, could probably hold 50 to 100 terabytes, maybe even more. A hundred thousand gigabytes. Easy. Liquid storage is the way of the future, so storing their data within the ocean itself makes a ton of sense to me. And even if it's not the ocean, and it's the planet itself, Earth has a liquid core underneath its solid surface, and then a solid inner core within. Not too different from the cross-section of an egg. And with that in mind, doesn't this egg look a bit reminiscent of the One Piece globe itself? If this is a cross-section of the One Piece planet, maybe that ring surrounding punk records is the transmitter sending and receiving data, which would then mean that the red line <coughs> or green line was sort of an antenna ring constructed by the ancient kingdom, maybe the Lunarians who then lived on top of it and created all their wonderful inventions and advancements using the ideas and dreams collected from humanity. Not a crazy idea considering their possible homeland, the moon, had a kingdom and universal power system built beneath the surface. We don't know how deep down Emu climbed to reach those vaults, but there's a good chance there is an internal structure to the red line we don't know about yet. And if the ocean is where all the data or energy is Stored, then believe it or not, this would tell us a ton about the One Piece world. If the dreams of humanity are stored in the ocean, then no wonder Devil Fruit users, people powered by humanity's dreams for the future, lose their energy and become immobile in large bodies of water. The water is trying to absorb the dream energy or whatever and assimilate it into the records. It's actually pulling the so-called true body, the dream, powering the Devil Fruit user into itself. This also explains why even a small amount of sea stone can have the effect that it does. Plus, keep going with it and this also explains where things like fishman and minks come from. If this information or data extracted from humanity is stored in the sea, then what happens to the fish that live in that sea? When Zunisha drinks that same water and sprays it onto his back, what happens to all the jungle animals living there? When this water rains down on the soil and the flowers tended to by the bugs of the earth, what happens to them? What happens to the mushrooms? It could be that this technology, this ocean records, much like Vegapunk's inventions, was a success but came with an unintended side effect. It successfully achieved its purpose, but in the process, it also altered all the other kinds of life out there. Not so unlike Caesar creating smiles by pouring sad directly into the water source of trees, except instead of changing the flora, this system changed the fauna of the world. Something like this could spur humanity to panic. I mean, if I woke up one morning and Waratsumi was standing right outside my window, I'd shit my pants. Some of the more reactionary people may have used this as an excuse to treat their new neighbors as lesser. Some used it to take advantage of them. The ancient kingdom, however, had different values. They had advanced technology. They had robots, cyborgs, and more. All the benefits of a futuristic utopia. They had a full understanding of the world around them and how to use it. And so, maybe this ocean too was something they could weaponize. Now this is a total reach, but hear me out. Maybe this ability to interact with or maybe even control the voice of all things allows the person with said power to weaponize the energy stored within the ocean. Maybe the three-eyed people were created by the ancient kingdom with the intention of controlling this energy source. And then they could do things like create knock-up streams, aqua lagunas, Florian triangles, and maybe even use the infinite energy source to create an artificial sun that could, theoretically, if we really focused hard enough and used our imagination, drop beams of energy on top of islands, leave holes in the ocean, and make places permanently sunny. A big thing we can learn from punk records is possibly that a main brain is required for this idea to work. If the ocean was this big supercomputer, and dreams in the voice of all things course through it, maybe these three-eyed people were designed to be its user, and opening your third eye would be kind of like putting on your Oculus Rift for some VR Reddit moderation. And looking at how punk records got started, there has to have been someone who was the original cog in the machine. Well, whoever it was, not singling out anyone in particular here, but whoever it was may have been a three-eyed person. They would be the main computer that operates the records of the world, of all the four blues and the grand line. They would have full command over the sea. And what's the word for sea in Japanese? Umi. And umi backwards is? Maybe science came too close to playing God. Maybe, in their quest for more knowledge, in their pursuit of utopia, the scientists of the ancient kingdom accidentally created a god that spanned their entire planet, warped the evolutionary paths of all its various creatures, and determined a strict set of laws for man to obey. And rather than harnessing the infinite energy of the ancient kingdom, rather than sharing it with the rest of the world, it feeds on it. 
It feeds on the dreams of man. And this mother nature, this intended goddess of the sea, is actually no goddess at all, but the central brain in this worldwide supercomputer. The god of the One Piece world who the Gorosei consult for answers, on which truths to keep and which lights to destroy. A One Piece version of Skynet, or the Matrix. Probably a mix of both, where, in exchange for the world government's protection, everyone's life force is being secretly taken away from them, little by little, to fuel both the metaphorical and literal machine. I don't know about you, but it feels like there's a character who wanted to take over the world who applied this exact system before. The name's slipping me, you guys let me know in the comments if you can think of it. But yeah, Matrix. Everyone in the world of One Piece is a living battery, who then go on to have families and create more batteries. When they go to sleep at night, people are unknowingly synchronizing with Emu's dream, a dream that sells them all these convenient truths about the world. And the world government, in return, oppress and kill and enslave the people and keep them longing for a better life. Why? What the fuck is their problem? It's because the worse your life is, the more you desire, the more you dream, the more energy you produce, all to feed this ancient mechanical god. Considering all the other cyborgs, robotics, and so on that we've seen, is this so crazy to imagine? We have a literal cyborg inspired by Vegapunk and a bioengineered human invented by Vegapunk's colleague, both on the Straw Hat crew. And these are not technological accomplishments considered impossible in the modern world of One Piece. We've come to accept it as a matter of fact thing at this point, so the ancient world must go even beyond this. Anything is possible. Here's a couple fun facts. Oda once said if he had the chance to make another manga, it would be one about mechas. He later said that he retracted this statement because One Piece allowed him to cover every genre he wanted. Looks like we're starting to see what he meant by that. Fun fact number two, Oda really likes Terminator. So much that he has a life-size statue of the Terminator T-800 in his office. How about the fact that this whole arc we're on right now is about Vegapunk? The punk records idea also came from the same guy responsible for creating the pacifista. Literal terminators in One Piece working directly for the world government. It's not just hot air, guys. Looking back at 1067, Jinbei expressed a very valid concern here about punk records, saying that a system like this would collapse if someone decided to insert the wrong ideology on top. When the ancient kingdom was defeated, what happened to their grand system? Guys with the wrong ideology got a hold of it. Here's another angle to look at it from. Maybe the 20 Kings thing is bullshit too. Maybe neither side won the War of the Void Century. Maybe Emu or Umi or Mother Nature or whatever they're calling this was created by the Ancient Kingdom, turned against her creators, eliminated them, and then conquered the rest of the world, operating in secrecy and using the 20 Kings as figureheads to cover up the dystopian reality. In other words, Emu is to this hypothetical ancient records what Vegapunk is to his own punk records. And just like Vegapunk, the main Stella body has six satellites, Emu has five elder stars. I believe the Gorosei are five clones or copies of Emu who, as a result, never age. They are each designated to their own corner of the world, one ruling each of the four blues and one for the Grand Line, and they all answer to Emu. Much like how Vegapunk has this apple antenna on his head to split his brain between each of his satellites, maybe a third eye or even this tall-ass crown might function as Emu's antenna. And every night when people go to sleep, Emu is essentially stealing their dreams through this ocean computer that nobody knows exists. Exists. Vegapunk surely does not, because he speaks of it as if it hasn't been done yet. But then again, if Emu was the computer or the one secretly controlling it, then no one should know of its existence. Even Sabo and Dragon, leading figures of the revolution, didn't seem to know until recently that there was anyone above the Gorosei. These guys made hating on the world government their whole personality, and even they don't know what the world government actually is. So it's safe to say that if there was ever a time when three-eyed people held the most public relevance, it's during the Void Century. Same goes for the Lunarians. I know I said to forget all my other theories for this one, but just for a second, think back to the idea I had about Nika being the Lunarian God King of the Ancient Kingdom. If Emu is some important three-eyed figure from history, and Nika was some important Lunarian figure in history, then maybe there's something to this idea. Does this look familiar? In ancient Egyptian culture, they have a third eye of their own. This is the Eye of Horus, also known as the Mind's Eye. Interesting thing, if you flip the Eye of Horus in the other direction, it becomes the Eye of Ra, the Sun God of Egypt. Third Eye, Sun God Eye. Third Eye, Sun God Eye. I'm not joking. But it doesn't stop there. The Egyptians were actually masters of medicine, and their hieroglyphs were used for mathematical and medical purposes. The Mind's Eye, the Third Eye, the Eye of Horus, this fucking eye is so cool. It was designed in a way where you could actually match it up to the side view of your brain and damn it, it actually fits. Want to hear something crazier? This symbol, while looking like just an eye, is actually meant to represent all of the human senses. And prepare for this, is actually broken up into six individual parts for each 
of the senses, and each part's corresponding sense actually matches up to the spot in the brain responsible for producing that sensation. This circle part in the middle here is the part of your brain that processes vision. This circle part of the eye is also the vision part of the symbol. The triangle part at the front here that kind of looks like a nose is, you guessed it, the symbol associated with smell. And what do you know, this matches with the part of your brain that is responsible for smell. And this continues for each of the other senses, all coming together to make up the third eye. So the third eye in Egypt was very intentionally designed to look like the brain and to be broken or separated into six pieces, six parts of the mind. I'm not bullshitting here, guys. This is coming from an actual research article on a government website, the National Library of Medicine. You can read more about this online, but the hieroglyphs and the symbology of ancient Egypt that inspired the poneglyphs of One Piece were actually very intricately designed. And Oda is without a doubt aware of this stuff because he references it a ton in Alabasta, the first place we ever find a poneglyph. And what are three-eyed people able to do? Read the poneglyphs. It all comes full circle. So the conclusion I've come to after all this is that Emu is a supercomputer overlord, the original punk records secretly oppressing humanity and feeding off the dreams of people. The artificial sun is that same weapon that wiped out Lelucia, and dreams are the mechanism by which everything in One Piece came to be. Devil Fruits may be the only way to win because they're the only means by which regular people can access those dreams, make them tangible, and fight back. And thus, Mother Nature, the ocean, hates Devil Fruits because they are the only element of chaos in this system of control that Emu's been trying so hard to maintain. Ordinarily, this would be too much for me to swallow at once, pause. especially considering most of this was assumptions built on assumptions built on educated guesses. And I don't think this is accurate by any means, but the connections are at the very least uncanny. The linchpin in all this for me, however, comes from the fact that this idea isn't as unique or as specific or as crazy as I previously thought. Because apparently another person thought of a very similar set of story beats 21 years ago. And so with all this in mind, it's finally time we talk about it. This other magical manga that I've been hyping up for 30 minutes. The Music of Mary is a manga by Usamaru Furuya that was recommended to me in one of my streams by a user named Jishoji. So thank him for this video existing because he told me about this thing. He noticed it had a lot of notable connections to One Piece's themes and the themes I talked about in all my other videos. He also pointed out that it was published in 2001, well before the Alabasta arc was even finished. So the era of manga was similar and the story had enough connections to warrant a look. Because it was so short, I figured, ah, oh, why the hell not? Let's give it a read. And man oh man, <laughs> where do we begin? Music of Mary, as in Mary Joie, published in Japan by Oda Publishing Company, published in America by One Piece Books? Now, obviously, I'm not insinuating this manga actually has any weight on the events of One Piece. I'm not saying these connections are official or confirmed, and I'm not saying Oda's stolen or chosen to reference any of these ideas. At best, he may have read this manga in passing and forgot about it years ago, maybe subconsciously making a similar idea down the road at best, and I think even that is unlikely. At worst, it's a total coincidence. However, I'll let you come to your own conclusions. The reason this is important to me is that, especially in storytelling, similar setups often lead to similar or at least comparable conclusions. If the setup of this manga is analogous to One Piece in this many ways, then we should look at where those plot points take us. Maybe the way one story ends can clue us into how the other one will. Alright, spoiler warning now. Skip to here if you want to read it yourself. It's only 18 chapters or something, so it's quick. If not, Buckle up, because it's about to get wild in here. Here's a five-minute summary of the entire story. The music of Mary takes place in a utopian paradise where people live on various islands with various cultures on a vast ocean, and everyone gets along without ever fighting. Their world is so peaceful that it's described as living in a dream. Our story is set mostly in a workshop town called Gil, where people produce all sorts of marvels of technology. Robotic animals, prosthetic limbs, and special inventions like a dream camera are all made here and traded with the surrounding islands, some of which include an island where people live around a giant tree and eat the fruit that fall from it. All the people in this country worship a creepy mechanical goddess named Mary and her three wise men of the forest who are said to watch over the entire world. Mm-hmm. Yup. Cool. Now, these beliefs don't just come from nowhere, you see. They actually have their own religious text, the Book of Pirito, and the priests of this town are the ones who interpret it. But these guys aren't all just ordinary priests. Many of them are also researchers and archaeologists who spend their days digging beneath the earth and discovering ancient technology from a highly advanced civilization of the past lost for thousands of years. 
We'll come back to this in a second. Plot-wise, this is a short romance story about two characters. This chick named Pippi, or at least I hope that's how you pronounce it, the daughter of some scientist who looks like Albert Einstein. She's not really important, though. And this bowl cut named Kai, who likes to jerk it to Mary sometimes. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. The goddess Mary is real and Kai can see her. Years ago, on an innocent trip to the beach, Kai nearly drowned and was pulled to the bottom of the sea. There he experienced a dream where he met the three wise men who gave him two powers. They brand him with two musical symbols, much like the third eye thing on their forehead, a symbol known as a fermata usually used to draw out the last note of a musical piece. They also give him the ability to see Mary and <clears throat> the ability to hear the voice of all creation. No, I'm not kidding. This kid straight up listens to the rocks and hears the emotions and wishes of everything and everyone. No one else can though, but people are cool with it. Kai's the only one who knows that this goddess is there. And he notices there's a sad music constantly emanating from her body that only Kai can hear. Well, what's it for? Turns out the technology the researchers have been finding are actually tools of death, machines designed for war, a concept foreign to their utopian world. The lore is that thousands of years ago, man was selfish, hateful, and greedy. So as a result, man spent thousands of years warring and fighting and killing each other. Eventually this continued for so long that God, Mary, became tired of man's shit and flooded the world with water, sinking that past civilization beneath the waves forever. As man rose again, wishing for man not to repeat their mistakes, Mary began playing a music that people didn't even know they were listening to. And this music is what keeps the hearts of man calm. It's what keeps their world at peace. But you see, there's one small problem. Kai soon after learns that this music is a double-edged sword. Something I didn't mention earlier is that this society, while a technological wonderland, is also one lacking in true progress. For whatever reason, no matter how hard they try, they cannot make machines that fly, like planes, or machines that are automated, like computers and automata. Every time they do, shortly after they are made, the machines short circuit or break down. Every time people try to fly, it always ends in failure. This is why the archaeologists keep on researching and digging down, so that they can understand the truth and reasoning behind their limits. Soon after which Kai realizes that Mary's music is the cause. It's because that when man learns to fly and when man learns that he can work without using his own hands, people then strive for more. People become greedy. And so in exchange for peace, Mary and her music places a limit on human technology and progress, preventing them from ever advancing technologically beyond an invisible line in the sand, forever keeping their dreams out of reach in exchange for the joy of a peaceful life. Until one day, at the dawn of the new year, Mary's music stops playing, and Mary herself begins falling apart. And Kai watches as all the people of the world suddenly begin to feel negative emotions like greed, jealousy, fear, and so on. Utopia starts to fall apart, and Kai is finally met with the three wise men once more, who tell him that, with the stopping of her music, humanity's emotions have been set free. Kai then uses the mark on his hand to open a hole into the earth and descend, where he then finds a jungle of gears and machinery well beyond any human's imagination, deep beneath the ocean. It turns out, they are actually inside of Mary, and where her brain should be, there's actually a music box instead. Nothing but a giant music box, except for a small key that can only be turned by the marked one, Kai. This is where the three wise men reveal the real truth, that Mary was actually not a god at all. The truth is, Mary was actually created long ago by humans, humans of the past who became so advanced and saw all the horrors born from this advancement desired to end the bloodshed and war of their era for good. Man decided to set himself back, not God. They used their advanced knowledge to construct a God for themselves, Mary, who would keep humanity in check and keep them at peace. And now that her music is stopped, Kai is given a choice. Turn the key, start the music again, and return to the stagnant society they had, or leave the key be and give humanity the freedom to progress forward. Kai decides to not turn the key, putting his faith in humans and setting them free. After which, Mary falls apart, and the old, ancient world rises out from deep beneath the ocean, starting a new dawn for humanity. I know, there's a couple chapters more after this, but in my opinion, the manga should have ended here because the rest of the story is some it-was-all-in-their-head type crap and doesn't actually make a point. Sucks, kinda but I guess it's related. However, as far as everything else goes, I feel as though Furuya and Oda were on the same wavelength. Reading this all made me wonder, is that what Rayleigh meant by coming to their own conclusion? Was the One Piece itself not simply a treasure, but a choice? Maybe the treasure itself is the key. 
the off button, and the one who reaches Laugh Tale is the one fated to decide the future of humanity. Do they end the system and keep such a power out of the hands of people, holding the world back for its own sake? Do they start the world of the past anew and risk the void century happening all over again? Or maybe they break free from the cycle entirely. I'd like to imagine that the choice at the end of all of this will be one between freedom and one of peace, where it seems like you can only have one or the other, and Luffy will be the only person capable of making both choices at once. I'll end this video with a quote from the main priest and researcher Ghoul, who commented very beautifully on the dilemma presented not only before us, but possibly by the scholars of Ohara as well. It seems we have stumbled upon the solution to a problem that has been unsolvable for a very long time. A most terrible solution. I spoke to you previously of the before world where people were at each other's throats, but at that time technology and civilization were far more advanced than what we have today. Automated dolls and electric calculation machines were a part of everyday life. Giant mechanical birds carried huge numbers of people. It is said that even humans could be artificially created. Did those ancestors come too close to playing God? Is she preventing humanity from crossing a technological line? The Mary that we worship, is that the reason she was born? Human technology has not advanced for the last few thousand years. We have continued to encounter numerous inexplicable failures. We do not see the line drawn in front of us. It is one thing to limit us to tools as extensions of human hands, but the moment we create self-sufficient machines that free human hands, our desire is awakened to reach for more and more. Now we reach, yet cannot advance, all while being assured a carefree life. Are we merely birds in a cage? Mary is more than just kindness. That smile maintains peace in our hearts and forms barriers to our progress. Mary's is a smile of both love and despair. Yeah, fuck it. I like the other idea better.